Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Warmington. I'm with the communications team at Public Safety Canada. It's my pleasure to be with you here today. Bonjour, je m'appelle Tim Warmington. Je suis membre de l'équipe de communication et sécurité publique Canada. C'est un plaisir pour moi d'être avec vous aujourd'hui. Today, the Honorable Bill Blair, President of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada and Minister of Emergency Preparedness is joined by the Honorable Mike Farnworth, Deputy Premier and Minister of Public Safety and Solicitor General for British Columbia. For immediate availability, following an FPT meeting with the Federal Provincial Territorial Ministers for Emergency Management. Aujourd'hui, l'Honorable Bill Blair, Président du Conseil privé de la Reine pour le Canada et Ministre de la Protection civile, sera accompagné par l'Honorable Mike Farnworth, Vice-Premier ministre et Ministre de la Sécurité publique et Solliciteur général de la Colombie-Britannique pour un point de presse à la suite de la réunion FPT des ministres fédéraux, provinciaux et territoriaux concernant la gestion des mesures d'urgence. A reminder for today's media availability that broadcasters only have permission to use the main feed and not the feed with interpretation. Un rappel, les diffuseurs ont seulement la permission d'utiliser le flux principal et non celui avec interprétation. To give you an idea of how today's event will unfold, we will hear brief remarks from Ministers Blair and Farnworth, followed by a question and answer session. Pour vous donner un aperçu du déroulement d'aujourd'hui, Les ministres Blair et Farnworth prendront la parole. Ensuite, nous aurons une période de questions. Alors, sans délai, s'il vous plaît, accueillons l'honorable Bill Blair, président du Conseil privé de la Reine pour le Canada et ministre de la Protection civile, à dire quelques mots. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming the honorable Bill Blair, president of the Queen's Privy Council for Canada and Minister of Emergency Preparedness, to say a few words. Merci, Tim. Bon après-midi à tous. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. Before we begin, I'd, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And I am very pleased today to be joined by my co-chair um, of the Forum of Federal, Provincial, and Territorial Ministers responsible for emergency management, the Honorable Mike Farnworth, Deputy Premier and BC Minister of, of Public Safety and Solicitor General uh, for the for province of British Columbia. We have just wrapped today a very productive meeting with our federal, provincial and territorial colleagues discussing our shared emergency management priorities and initiatives. And we have endorsed and approved two very important new publications, the details of which I will share with you very shortly. Meetings like this give us an important opportunity to discuss the profound and often severe impacts that recent events have had upon Canadians. These are impacts that Minister Farnworth, of course, knows all too well having seen them firsthand when British Columbia was ravaged by historic wildfires and flooding last year. I have recently had the opportunity to go to British Columbia and, and share, see with Minister Farnworth the impact that natural disasters can have on Canadians. The reality is that climate change means severe weather events like these are, are occurring far too frequently and are likely to increase in scale, frequency and unpredictability. And therefore it is more crucial than ever that federal, provincial and territorial governments work together. And we must draw upon lessons learned and develop plans to reduce the impact of extreme weather uh, events and other emergencies on our communities. It is important that we all exercise leadership and coordinate our efforts to strengthen emergency management in Canada. And this is a commitment that I share with all my provincial and territorial colleagues from across the country. Today, we endorse the 2021-2022 Federal, Provincial and Territorial Emergency Management Strategy Interim Action Report. This plan helps advance the outcomes under the 2019 Emergency Management Strategy of Canada, and it contains concrete steps and priorities that we are all committed to take within our respective jurisdictions over the course of the coming year. The strategy will guide all levels of government and their respective emergency management partners in all sectors of society in order to carry out our priorities aimed at strengthening Canada's emergency preparedness. There was an agreement among colleagues that working alongside Indigenous leadership is critical to this process as climate change and severe weather have a disproportionate impact on Indigenous communities across the country. And during this meeting, we also had the opportunity to, to update on, on the new flood hazard identification and mapping program. This is a significant and timely news item as flooding continues to be the most frequent and costly natural disaster in Canada. 
updated flood maps are being developed in partnership with provinces, territories, municipalities, and Indigenous organizations. And they will also be used to develop an online portal that will keep Canadians informed on flood risks and provide resources and suggestions on how to best protect their homes and community. It will also facilitate the development of a new national flood insurance program. And all of these initiatives will help us prepare for future emergencies to build a stronger and more resilient Canada. We know that clear and efficient communication is imperative to this work. And knowing how important this is, we also uh, have are developing recommendations on a public safety broadband network through the establishment of a temporary national coordination office. A public sef safety broadband network will be a secure, high-speed wireless data network that emergency responders and other public safety workers will be able to use to communicate with each other, both in emergencies and during daily operations. Today, ministers approved and released the office's final report, a public safety broadband network for Canada, a Canadian approach to implementation of the next generation of public safety communications. I very much look forward to working with all of our partners towards the development of a public safety broadband network that will meet Canada's diverse needs and will keep and improve our first, and ensure that our first, impro, first responders and public safety personnel are effective in maintaining the safety for all Canadians. And finally, I would like to highlight an initiative on the Emergency Management Exemplary Service Award. This award will recognize the incredible individuals and organizations who've dedicated their lives to emergency management, whether as employees or as volunteers. And today we are officially launching a call for nominations for this prestigious award. The nomination period will be open be, uh, to beginning today until July 1st, and recipients will be selected later this summer. Over the past two years, we have seen our first responders show up every time they are required through pandemic, historic fires and flooding, and every catastrophic event in between. I would like to take the opportunity to encourage everyone to nominate a deserving individual or organization to recognize their exemplary work. And if I may conclude my remarks, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my provincial and territorial colleagues for a very productive meeting. As we are all committed together to, to protecting Canadians to ensure that their property and our environment are, are, are built stronger and more resilient, we will continue to work together to ensure that we are prepared for all emergencies while we build back stronger those who have been impacted by ca catastrophe in the past. Thank you, Merci, and I'll turn this back over to you, Tim. Thank you, Minister Blair. Merci, Minister Blair. Maintenant, j'invite l'honorable Mike Farnworth, vice-premier ministre et ministre de la Sécurité publique et solliciteur général de la Colombie-Britannique, de prendre la parole. I now invite the honorable Mike Farnworth, deputy premier and minister of public safety and solicitor general for British Columbia to speak. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, I'm Mike Farnworth, the Minister responsible for emergency management in British Columbia, and I'm pleased to be speaking to you virtually from the territory of the Coast Salish peoples. I'd also like to thank my federal, provincial, and territorial colleagues for a great conversation today. While recent climate-related disasters have been amongst the most challenging on record here in British Columbia, people across the country have endured extreme weather over the past year, whether it's flooding, wildfires, windstorms, or drought. That's why today's discussions and the actions coming out of it are so important. Today, we unanimously endorse the 2021-22 Emergency Management Strategy Interim Action Plan. This plan outlines steps to each jurisdiction will take to strengthen our resilience to disasters. And we discussed funding the, from Natural Resources Canada for new and updated flood maps. Floodplain mapping that will help provinces and territories identify areas at risk during extreme weather events and help us identify the priority areas for improved diking. We've also discussed the Disaster Financial Assistance Arrangement Program and how to make it as effective as possible so we are providing the appropriate support to Canadians after a disaster. And we are all committed to working in partnership with Indigenous leaders and communities to improve emergency management supports and looking forward to further work in this area. In British Columbia, at our time of need during the flood response last fall, the federal government and other provinces answered our calls, our calls for support. Coming out of this experience and the discussions with colleagues today, 
we all agree that we need to continue to work in partnership and collaboration because together we can strengthen our resilience and response capabilities to better protect people from future disasters. I wanna thank my colleagues for a productive meeting and for bringing their knowledge and experience to the table today. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Farnsworth. Merci, nous passons maintenant la période des questions. We will now open the floor to questions to give everyone a chance to participate. Please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Also, we would be grateful if you would specify if your question is for Minister Blair or Minister Farnworth. Afin de donner la chance à tout le monde de participer, veuillez vous limiter à une question et un suivi. Nous vous serions également reconnaissants de bien vouloir préciser à quel ministre vous souhaitez adresser vos questions. Operator, please proceed with our first question. Nous sommes prêts pour notre première question. Thank you, merci. Please press star one at this time if you have a question. S'il vous plaît, appuyez étoile 1 maintenant pour poser une question. And we have the first question. La première question is from Dylan Robertson, the Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead. Uh, Minister Blair, thanks for taking our question. Uh, what can you tell us about how you envision changing DFAA's funding formula to incentivize prevention, and how did your provincial colleagues react to what you were putting on the table today? Thank you, Dylan, and, and, and it's, an, it's an important question, and, and just for those who may not be aware, um, Canada has what is called a disaster financial assistance arrangement. And, and in the event of, of, of natural disaster um, occurring anywhere in the country, the first response is almost inevitably coming from the provinces and territories, as Mr. Farnworth will know all too well. Um, and then the federal government provides financial assistance through the provinces to effective communities, businesses and residents um, that have been impacted by the natural event. Um, and, and what we have seen over the past a number of years is, is a significant increase in the frequency and scale of some of these disasters. And as a consequence, you know, we, we have continually invested significant amounts of money in recovery and rebuilding. But one of the things that we have learned very clearly over the past number of years is that just building back to the way things were before is not satisfactory. And there needs to be a greater investment in, 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 to ensure that when, when we rebuild, it's done in, in recognition of the, increase, the increasing threat of climate change that, that's bringing to a number of these, these events and the impact that it, that it has on communities. And so, you know, the, the provinces and territories actually asked us to initiate a review other than that disaster financial assistance arrangement. And I want to assure my provincial and territorial colleagues and Canadians right across the country, that review will be conducted in a very collaborative and cooperative way with our provincial and territorial partners. We are all very significantly impacted uh, by these, these types of, of, of natural disaster events, particularly um, as it pertains to flood and fire in this country. We know that the cost to individual Canadians, to our provincial and territorial partners, to the country has, has, is rising significantly. And we want to make sure that we are there for each other, but that we spend the money wisely. So, so that, and, and, and I will, will also just highlight a lot of our discussion today was really about how we make sure that we invest that money to prevent and to mitigate disaster, not merely to recover from it. The recoveries of course is essential and very important. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're investing that money to make it less likely that Canadians will be harmed by these types of events in the future. And, and of course, there is quite understandable concern among our provincial and territorial partners. That's one of the great things about this forum where, where we come together as partners and, 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 and friends, frankly, to have these important discussions because all the orders of government have a responsibility to protect Canadians, to be there when, when they are impacted by these types of natural events and, and to make sure that we help Canadians recover as quickly and, and as, as, as effectively as, as possible. Thank you. And um, I'm wondering if you might be able to put into plain language what that reform might look like, because I know that you're starting the process to consult on what DFAA will actually look like. But I'm wondering, you know, are we talking about like a sliding scale in terms of, uh, you know, compensation based on how much of the properties are in, in a floodplain still? Or are, are we talking about just less money for the rebuilding and more into new builds? I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around 
what a changed DSAA formula might actually look like from your perspective. Yeah. First, first of all, the conversation has not gone to less money, but rather to ensure that the money that we are all expending. And, and by the way, although the federal government has a significant role and responsibility through the DFAA program, the cost in responding to these disasters is also very significant for our, for our provincial and territorial partners. Um, there, there are a number of elements of, of the DFAA program that I think just simply need to be modernized. And one of the things Minister Farnworth and I've been discussing uh, quite extensively is, it, it, it is as a result of the rebuild that is now required um, in, in, in British Columbia, um, arising from the heat dome event, uh, wildfires season and unprecedented flooding that, that, that occurred in British Columbia. We want to make sure that, first of all, we're there for the people of British Columbia, as we would be for in any uh, community or, or province and territory across the country. We want to be there for them to help in that recovery, but we also want to make sure that that recovery is done in such a way as, as, as to ensure it, it less likely that we'll have to go back and do this work again in a few years' time in the event of another, another such uh, of, of a flooding event, for example. Um, in, in plain language, though, but I, I think it also re re identifies that a number of people, for, for example, with overland flooding, Canadians can't get a, can't currently get um, if insurance for that type of a, of, of a natural event. Um, and so we're working together again on the development of a national flood insurance plan. There's, there are many moving component, components to that. But we want, we want to make sure that we are, first of all, that, that, that all of our orders of government are there for Canadians in recovery, but we also want to build stronger, more resilient communities and recognizing the impact of climate change uh, on, and, and other, you know, on, on all hazards of approach to other types of events. You know, we've learned a lot of lessons from, from our recent experience with the pandemic, with these natural disasters, and even, and even some events with respect to cyber attacks and other threats and risks to, to our communities and threats to critical infrastructure. And it, th these can be very expensive events for Canadians. We want to make sure that we spend uh, Canadian dollars wisely and, and appropriately. Thank you. All right. Merci. Thank you. That gets sense we The next question is from Colin Fries the, from the Globe and Mail. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Minister. Thank you for engaging. Um, Obviously, paying for disasters to clean up the remediation is one big part of emergency management. Another big part of it is is warning people about imminent disasters as they are happening. We are probably about weeks away from here uh, in uh, Nova Scotia in the inquiry about how the police in that province didn't know how to use the national public alerting system two years ago when a gunman was, was killing 20 people, more than 20 people in that province. We're a year removed from the epic uh, floods and wildfires and heat events in BC, where BC had not used that system at all and was reserving it for, a, I think, a tsunami warning uh, and not for those disasters. Uh, this is changing, but I'm just wondering if you guys have discussed how the provinces are using the National Public Alerting System. Uh, Minister Farnworth, I want to ask you if, if you're prepared to use it in the coming wildfire season. And Minister Blair, I want to ask you, what you're doing to make sure that the um, provinces are using this national system. And, and Colin, let me let me begin, and and then I I think I, I know my colleague and friend Mr. Farnworth will will want to speak to this in British Columbia. But you know you're you're referring to the national public alerting system, and and you know the. the I believe it's, all, it's, it's critically important. The first responder to the vast majority of emergencies in this country is, is not the police, fire, or ambulance. It's the public. The public responds first uh, to, to, the, to the advent of, of, of any kind of a disaster and making sure that the public is, is informed in a timely way and given the information that they need in order to take the steps necessary to keep themselves safe is a critical part of, of our efforts to keep people safe. And that's why we you know, are, have developed a national public alerting system. We have, there, are, there are issues of governance, consistency, accessibility, how it's being used in, in various jurisdictions and how it's being funded. And, and, and that, that did form an important part of our discussion today. I can tell you there are lessons to be learned. 
from the, the mass casualty inquiry that's taking place in Nova Scotia and the terrible tragic events that took place um, in, in April of, of 2020 in Port of Peak, Nova Scotia. There are also lessons to be learned from our experiences in other jurisdictions as they face floods and fires. And I'm sure Minister Farnworth can speak to this. We recognize the importance of ensuring that Canadians have access to timely information to keep themselves safe through the, 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 the enhancement of the national public alerting system. We recognized and discussed today that we have work to do, but it's a priority for our, for our group. We, we do have um, I, a, a review team going, working, doing that work right now. And I'm sure Minister Farnworth can speak more about that because he spoke to it today at our meeting. Mike? Yeah, no, thanks, Bill. Yeah, it is our intention. It was announced in our recent provincial budget that it's BC's intention to have uh, the alert ready system uh, broadcast intrusive uh, in place for our Prashet season. Um, we've been working very closely with local government and the uh, uh, Indigenous uh, communities of British Columbia to make sure we've got a system that will work uh, in on, on recognizing that a number of municipalities, uh, local governments already have alert systems. And so we're making sure that there's no duplication and overlap. And that's, that's quite a complex process. But that being said, it, it's our intention that we have a, a province-wide system in place uh, and ready for the uh, the first set season and the uh, upcoming fire season. Right, and and if I could, I could I, I just want to ask a, a follow up question about two other issues in sort of federal provincial relations that may have been discussed at the FPT meeting today. Uh, I'm wondering if you discuss the issue of who is going to pay for the 20 percent across the board RCMP raises that were negotiated by the federal government earlier this uh, uh, last year in 2021. There's a dispute as, as to whether the federal government should uh, step in there. I'm also wondering if um, there was any discussion as to whether how civilian police can investigate sexual assaults on military bases, uh, given the questions of jurisdiction that, ha that have arisen uh, in, in places like CFB Esquimalt, where, uh, where the nearest local police forces may not feel all that well equipped to, uh, to do this. I'm, I'm just wondering if these issues were discussed at all or if, if there's a way forward. Yeah, and, and to be too clear, Colin, first of all, I'm well aware of, of, of both issues um, and, and certainly issues and discussions to take place with provinces and territories that have contracts with uh, uh, the RCMP to provide policing ser services in their jurisdiction and the, the over 150 municipalities that also contract with the RCMP. Those are very important discussions, but they didn't, they're not taking place in the context of emergency management, which, is, which was the, the, the purpose of today's meeting. There is another uh, table that we convene uh, with respect with public safety ministers that will, would speak to that issue, but it wasn't on the agenda today. And similarly with, with the issue you, you, you raise about um, the, the, the objective and independent investigation of certain types of allegations, that, that is more appropriately for that other table. Today, we've, we've, we focused um, our discussions primarily on the work that the provinces, territories, and Indigenous um, governments do together in order to respond to, to emergencies um, in, in this country, and, and we did not talk specifically about the delivery of policing services. There is, there is a forum for that, and it wasn't the forum that we were in today. Thank you. Merci. Once again, please press star one. If you have questions, de nouveau, n'hésitez pas à appuyer sur étoile pour toutes questions. Et la question suivante, the next question is from Sarah Ritchie, the Canadian Press Ottawa Bureau. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Minister Blair. My question is for you. Uh, your predecessor, Ralph Goodale, said back in 2015 that the federal government needs to stop bailing out people who rebuild in flood zones eventually. I'm curious if that's really the position of your government and how the National Flood Insurance Program would fit in with that. Yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. And, and and frankly, I think I I understand the frustration. And by the way, it's not just you know our government's frustration, but we're hearing this from municipal and provincial governments as well, where you know certain areas that 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 experience and have are experiencing increasing frequency of 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 floods and and when public dollars are are spent to help those people in recovery, and we need to help those people in recovery. But when we continue to build into high risk situations. Uh, that, that I think I think that that does require a more thoughtful approach. 
And so we've, we've undertaken two very important initiatives uh, in response to that. First of all, one of the challenges that municipalities, provinces and territories, communities right across the country face is, is, is in many circumstances, an inadequacy of, of, of you know, robust flood mapping data um, for which people can make informed decisions about where they could or should build. Um, we also know that there are a number of, of existing you know, residents and businesses that are on areas that, that experience you know, periodic flooding. And, and sometimes it, the, the language usually used is a hundred year floodplain or a 200 year floodplain. Um, and, and so there are, there are risks associated, associated to building in those locations. One of the things that we have seen you know, over the past several years as a direct result of climate change, we're seeing the increasing frequency and the scale of those types of flooding events are happening far too often. And one of our one of our provincial jurisdictions today spoke about having three 100 year flood events in the last decade. Um, and, and so clearly some of the, the, that, the previous standards that were applied are changing in direct consequence of the impact of climate change. And that's one of the things that adds great urgency to our work. We also know that in many cases, people who have built in those areas or reside in those areas are unable to get any form of overland flood insurance and which can significantly as, add to the cost of recovery. And so we are, we've done a couple of important things. We, we're working with National Resources Canada and Environment Canada in the development of a far more uh, robust and, and comprehensive flood mapping system. It'll also be made available to provinces, territories, and to municipalities and to individual Canadians uh, through a flood portal so that they can go and get the information to make, to make well-reasoned evidence-based decisions as to where it's safe to build and where you know, they choose to, to go into an area that, that perhaps may, be, may represent a higher risk because it's in, a, in, a, in a, 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 an area prone to flooding then, then they, there will actually be actuarial data and evidence for which an, an insurance company can make decisions as to whether or not a municipality wants to allow a building in that location or whether the insurance can be obtained. And th those are ways in which those risks can be, can be properly mitigated and, and addressed to, to avoid the situation um, that you referred to, um, where we just see, see just building over and over and again in areas that, that clearly aren't suitable. Uh, for, for, for people to build their homes or to, or to establish their businesses. And so we're making sure that that data is available. And we're also recognizing that, you know, there, there are some other jurisdictions, Minister Farnworth and I, for example, were in Abbotsford last week or earlier this week, Mike, and time goes by. And we, we went to the pumping station at Barrowtown. And I think all Canadians saw this extraordinary thing that happened last November, where literally hundreds of citizens from the area, from down from Chilliwack and, 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 and other places came down to the Barrowtown pumping station and sandbagged around it in order to, to preserve that facility. We also saw, you know, the, the really challenged, this, this extraordinary event really challenged existing diking systems and, and water diversion and pumping systems in that area. And so it also requires that we look very, very thoughtfully at, at rebuilding those in such a way that recognizes the, the new threat, the threat that exists as a result of climate change. And what we're seeing is a greater frequency of, of events that are going to be really challenging to keep those areas that are, that are very important to us, communities and, and businesses that are very important to the country, that we can keep them dry and safe as well. And so it is going to require not just more better information through flood mapping, but more investment in, in, in those mitigation and prevention measures that are going to keep those communities safe. And Mike, I'll, I'll, I, I've gone on a bit there, but I'll go over to you for any other observation you might have. No, I, um, I think you've summed the, uh, the situation up uh, quite well. I mean, one of the things we've learned from uh, um, uh, here in BC from the recent floods is, is that in terms of building back better, and we've signed up for the Sendai framework, so it's not just, which is very important, it's about, it's not just about response and recovery, but identifying risk and mitigation. And so the flood mapping program is going to be particularly important. But many communities are going to have these decisions. Uh, we saw in Grand Forks, for example, uh, after the flooding, the decision not to rebuild uh, in the uh, in, in in the area that was uh, flooded, but in fact to relocate that subdivision somewhere else. And I expect that you will see communities will want to be doing that uh, as they as they come to terms with climate change and the increased risk uh, with uh, with uh, flood and uh, potential fires uh, in a way that we've never seen before. We have okay, time for one more question. Oh, uh, nous avons le temps pour une dernière question. Sorry, I, do I get a follow-up here? or? Yeah, you're right. I apologize. I jumped again. Go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. No, no, no problem. 
Okay, so Minister Blair, I'm also hoping you can give some more detail on this national flood insurance uh, program. I understand this is a work in progress, but can you tell me what kind of structure this would take place? And is there anything already in place within Canada or within one of the provinces that uh, you're looking to to sort of build this? Yeah, I, I think we want to make sure that that this is done in a very you know thoughtful and evidence based and informed way. And so about 18 months ago, we established a, a task force and it's, it's a multidisciplinary task force. It's made up of, of a number of disciplines in, in, and perhaps most importantly, certainly government representation is very strong, but we've also reached out to the insurance industry and through the Insurance Bureau of Canada, they've been participating in that um, task force. And, and we've asked them uh, you know, to, to go in and, and look at a number of different um, alternatives and, 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 and to make recommendations on a path forward. Um, their report will be made available to us and made public um, in, in, by late spring. So in, in, the, in the coming weeks and months, um, I, I'm, we're very much looking forward to that. But, but when we receive that report, there's still gonna be a great deal of work to do. And that was part of our discussion today with my provincial and territorial partners. Um, this, is, this is work that we must do collaboratively, that we must do cooperatively. You know, each, each, each of us has a strong interest in the development of a national flood insurance plan, but each of us also recognizes that there could it could represent significant challenges for existing communities and, 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 and our citizens um, as this program goes forward. So we're, we've still got some work to do. But we recognize its urgency, and and one of the things that I have tasked uh, our, my officials at, at, at public safety uh, to undertake is to move as quickly as possible, because we, we recognize that a real vulnerability exists in in every part of the country, but in particular those places which are experiencing flooding and and and, and fire, but mostly flooding, um, as it relates to, to to natural disasters. You know, the cost of, of recovery in a flood. Is, is significantly higher than for any other type of natural disaster. And, and it has represented a significant portion of the cost that both the provinces and the government through the D disaster financial assistance arrangement um, have been feel, experiencing over the past several years. And so we know that we've got work to do here and, and there's an urgency to it. That task force report I think is, is foundational and, and it's going to provide us with, with advice and, and, and direction That'll, that'll enable us to move forward. And we see it as a great priority. Um, it was on today's agenda for our discussion. I let my colleagues know that it would be coming forward on our, our, our agenda for our next meeting in the fall as well. And we're, go we're going to work on it together um, as, as rapidly as possible because I think it's something that Canadians need. Um, Canadi Canadians who, you know, who may find themselves in a vulnerable position, who want to have insurance against uh, such, such a catastrophic event, right now it's not available to them and we have to work with them to make sure that, that we make that, that, that available because it can help people in their recovery and it will help them make better decisions about where they establish themselves in the first place. Et la dernière question, the last question will be from Dylan Robertson, the Winnipeg Free Press. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for taking my questions again. Um, I'm wondering, Minister Blair, um, are you getting lobbied over the flood mapping proposal? Because clearly some groups would be losing cash if that amount of mapping is made public. Dylan, let me acknowledge. And first, there, there's there there is there is actually there's there's a reality in your question, which which is true. That if if you happen to own property uh, that's identified and made publicly identified as as being at risk because it's on a floodplain, it could it could affect the value of that property. Uh, there, it's also has has some potential. I think for those who are already located in high risk areas, um, that that it, it it could have an impact. On, on 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 the market value of, of 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 those homes or that business, but at the same time, I think the real value of developing this this information and making sure that it's available to communities and to Canadians, and if it's coupled with the, the important work of developing a national flood insurance plan, we can actually create better protection for those properties, and we can make better decisions with respect to you know where we're, we're going to build, where we where our communities are going to invest. I mean, it's, it, let me also acknowledge it's it's very impactful for Indigenous communities. You know, one of the things that we saw during the November flood events was a number of, of, of communities in British Columbia, and I think of, of the Indigenous communities up Highway 8 north, northwest of Merritt, Mike, um, that, that were hugely impacted uh, by, by these floods. And in, in some cases, their entire reserve territory has been, has been washed away. 
And, and so we, we have a lot of work to do there to help those communities to recover fr from this event. And we want to make sure that in that recovery, that it's done in an informed way so that they can be safe in the future and, and not face you know, a continuing cycle of, 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 of impact by, by these types of events. And so I think that this information is ultimately going to help us all make better, safer decisions um, as we continue to invest in our communities and build our homes. And, 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 but we want to make sure that people can do it in a safe way. Thank you. And my last follow-up is just about the, the looming flooding season in the prairies. We're seeing quite a lot of snowpack in Manitoba. I think there's some concerns in the other provinces as well as to what it's going to look like this spring. It seems like all the programs that exist right now are just going to be used as normal, regardless of what pressure the BC flooding has put on it during this fiscal year. Um, is, is that correct? Is nothing changing for the next uh, you know, three or four months? Well, a big part of, of, of being prepared for this is, is by tracking that very carefully. I will tell you, there was a discussion today with both Saskatchewan and Manitoba about, you know, th these are areas, particularly in southern uh, uh, Saskatchewan and much of Manitoba, that have been experiencing drought, which is another form of natural disaster um, over the past uh, a few years. And now they're seeing a very significant snowpack and, and you know, much depends on how it melts. Um, I, I, for example, in, in my discussion with, um, Minister uh, uh, Pennewick today from, uh, from, from Manitoba, we, we talked about the preparation and the work that, that, that Manitoba has been doing in preparation and, and, and in, in, in Manitoba to, to deal with the potential of floods that could happen in keeping highways open. You know, they've done some very good work in Manitoba um, with respect to, you know, the building of dikes and levees and, and other, you know, flood mitigation efforts. Uh, but 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 they're they're very thoughtful about it and and we'll be there to, to support them in every way possible and so making sure that people are well informed and and that there's a close analysis on this done and that we and we watch the weather carefully like one of the things that certainly we, we learned in, in the in the various early days of both the heat event the flood, the fire season and then the flood season mr farnworth and i for example in in, in british columbia were, were in regular communication and and making sure we were mobilizing resources as early and as quickly as possible the the the, the, the consequence of that event was was still catastrophic but but the better we're able to inform people to to take steps of mitigation um, you know we're working on that now certainly in Saskatchewan and Manitoba but we know that that, that we can do even better and that forms a lot much of the work that we are undertaking today at, at the joint ministers federal provincial territorial ministers uh, meeting to discuss this and the work that we'll continue to undertake um, in the coming weeks and months Mike any, anything you wanted to add because I know you're watching the Frechat situation in British Columbia very carefully as well yeah, no, we are. We've uh, we've got a significant uh, snowpack monitoring uh, throughout uh, British Columbia, uh, and, and it varies uh, in the northeast. It's 146 percent of normal in the Okanagan. It's 86 percent of normal, and the average around the province is 103. Uh, what's critical to us, of course, is is how it melts. Um, if we get uh, rapid melt, that creates problems. If we get a slow, steady melt, then we're ready. But what's also important is making sure that we've got the ability to deal with our diking. Uh, and that our dikes are upgraded and there have been repairs taking place to the dikes um, since our last floods. Uh, but again, uh, in BC, we wait, uh, sorry, it's not that we wait, that the most important forecast we will have will come at the beginning of April, because that really will give us an indication of the, the amount of snow, snow and the way that it's, uh, the way that it is melting and, and what we can expect. Yeah, and, and the last thing I might add to that, one of the things that we've heard is that in, in every case, you know, first of all, the, the, fir the first response to, to these types of events in British Columbia, for example, is emergency management BC. And, and, and you know, they, they're very well uh, organized and, and, and very responsive. And when uh, some of these, these events exceed the capacity of the local jurisdiction, they reach out for help as well. And, and so we, we, federally, we're also working with Canadian Armed Forces and with Canadian Red Cross and other civic partners um, civil in, in civic society in order to develop, uh, for example, a humanitarian workforce to respond to these types of events and to make sure that when the provinces uh, phone and, 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 and reach out and say, you know, that, that, that they need some help, um, we, we are able to respond as quickly as possible. And, you know, we've seen how effective this is. And, and for example, in our, in our, our co-chair today, um, Richard Mosson, he talked about uh, when the Yukon faced very significant flooding events last year, they reached out to the federal government, but they also reached out to their provincial partners. 
and help came from British Columbia, from Alberta and from Saskatchewan. It came from the federal government. And that's one of the things that I think is really quite extraordinary and something to be, to be acknowledged and celebrated in this country. That when each of us individually or any region of the country, province or territory faces this type of catastrophic event, that, that you know they, they're not alone in their response. And, and, and we've seen this throughout the pandemic. We've seen this throughout you know, the fire seasons and flood seasons. The provinces and territories come to help each other and, and they support each other. Um, and, 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 and I do my best to make sure the federal government uh, plays its important part as well. And, and I think that's something Canadians have an expectation that in this cooperative confederation of, of Canada, that people from all across the country will be there for each other. And, and I think in, in emergency response, um, we see the best evidence of that. And, 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 and we're, we all remain committed to that. You know, we, we all come from, you know, different regions of the country, sometimes from very different political backgrounds, but none of, none of those differences matter when people need our help and, and, and what we have seen in emergency response and what we're gonna to continue to work on in emergency response and preparation is that, is that we work together and collaboratively and, and support each other and that we're there for each other. Um, when, when catastrophe strikes and, and, and I've seen more than ample evidence of that right across Canada and we're, we're gonna do our best to continue with it. Merci. Ceci conclut l'événement d'aujourd'hui. Si vous avez des questions supplémentaires, nous vous invitons à envoyer un courriel à l'équipe des relations avec les médias du ministère en question. Thank you. This concludes today's media event. If you have additional questions, we invite you to call or email the media relations team of the relevant department or ministry represented today. Thank you. Thank you. Merci. The conference has now ended. La conférence est maintenant terminée. Please disconnect lines at this time.